Hi, so uh, as Katie said, I'm Gavin Francis, and I'm going to talk about the legacy of William Morris's gardener at Camscott Manor. I'm currently studying for my PhD at the University of Bath on the cultural identity of Plantsman's Gardens, and I'm researching how we protect and interpret um, important gardens that are created by significant cultural figures, and yet are made up of largely ephemeral plant-based materials, and therefore they fall outside of traditional heritage conservation. So Morris and Kelmscott are a central case study in my PhD as the gardens at Kelmscott has the potential to offer a dynamic reading of Morris's life and that will be unique to this space. Um, I've got a strong personal affinity for Morris and Kelmscott as it was also the subject of my MA dissertation. So I'll be showing several images today, some of which are from the Society of Antiquities <coughs> Archive at Kelmscott and some are from a new archive that's been found at the National Library of Wales, Aberystwyth. There's loads of brilliant images, and I've tried to like, cram lots in, so keep your eyes on the screen, because some of them will flash <laughs> really quickly. You might miss them. So when we think of William Morris, um, gardening is not one of the first things that springs to mind. There's a great polymath. He's got enough areas of expertise to his name already, an artist, pattern designer, manufacturer, poet, philosopher, socialist, and of course the founder of SPAB. Um, however, as I'll come to show you today, Morris's influence on gardens is as significant as his many other passions. And he was an important player in the development of garden design as he was in the progression of his other principal interests. So the physical act of gardening uh, was something that William had known all of his life. He'd kept his own garden since childhood, and he never thought of a house outside of the wider context of the garden. Uh, William believed that the two coexisted in unison, stating in one of his lectures how the garden should appear as part of the house or even the clothes of it. And much of what drove Morris as an artist and philosopher was derived from botanical form. He's part of a tradition of biomimetically focused artists and philosophers from Pugin and Ruskin, Christopher Dresser, and Morris's own cohorts in the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, who worked <coughs> by their own botanically opposite phrase, truth to nature. So nature and botany are the cornerstones of Morris's output and thinking. Now, the influence of Morris as a garden designer begins at Red House in Bexley Heath, where the house and garden were designed in collaboration with the architect and friend Philip Webb. Um, the garden was designed as a series of rooms within an orchard setting and placed emphasis on medieval details that related to the art he was engaged with at the time. And later, the gardens at Count Scott Manor maintained this layout of rooms, but were less formal in structure and composition than at Red House, less medieval herber and more plantsmen. And Keats Morris's perspective on the value of garden is found in the philosophy around the design of Red House, which was always a house and garden designed as one entity. And if you look on the, um, you can just about make that, look at the pointer. On the, the, the names of all the plants are on all of the designs for the building, but they were right from stage one. It was an essential part of the design. And you can see um, some sketches of medieval herbs as well that, that's been um, Jordan, so the integration of house and garden is part of the legacy of, of Red House. And this is really where our story begins in the setting of Camscott Manor, which was built around 1570 in the village of Camscott in West Oxfordshire. It's the type of country house which William described as being so comfortable in its surroundings that it appears to have grown up out of the ground. And Morris took out the shared lease on Camscott in 1871 with his friend and colleague Dante Gabriel Rossetti. So Camscott was perfect for William in many ways. Its position adjacent to the Thames connected it to William's life in London, both physically and psychologically. Katie's house might be. So the best way to understand just what the house meant to William is through his novel News From Nowhere, the socialist polemic about the ideals of community and living connected to the land. In this novel, Camscott Manor is used as the template <coughs> for a fictionalised ideal homestead. And in William's own words, I'll read an excerpt uh, where he first arrives at the house, because um, I think this helps to visualise our arrival at the garden today. So, the garden between the wall and the house was redolent of the June flowers, and the roses were rolling over one another with that delicious superabundance of small, well-tended gardens, which at first sight takes away all thought from the beholder save that of beauty. And the house itself was a fit guardian for all the beauty of this heat of summer. So the phrase that stands out for me and that I carry as a key signifier in my studies of Camscott is superabundance. If there are any gardens or garden enthusiasts present, you'll understand what he means by this phrase. 
when we stand in certain types of gardens, particularly in the early summer period, we experience the feeling of immersion in a garden of superabundance. It implies the generosity of the garden, both in produce and artistically. And certainly when we look at pictures of the garden from William's time, and also in the following period where the garden was tended by his daughter May, there's a sense that plants are enjoying free growth with little tailoring, lots of lushness. And a factor that stands out for me and that's absent from recent iterations of the garden is height. Even in areas of the garden that are largely herbaceous, there's a, a great deal of height to the plants present, which would have given the gardens a more intimate feel. So the gardens of Kelmscott came to encapsulate many of Morris's values and beliefs, not just strictly about garden design and flower use, but also around the philosophy and, uh, philosophies and ideals of life for the working man. It's during these years, too, that Morris's influence began to impact uh, the direction of gardening in the wider world. He contributed to William, Morris, uh, William Robinson's influential The Garden magazine and his opinions on Victorian carpet bedding that was really popular at the time. And uh, as he said, grown together profusely in order, I suppose, to show that even flowers can be thoroughly ugly. Comments like that can be heard echoed in William Robinson's uh, work, too. But his most lasting contribution to garden design is arguably through Gertrude Jekyll, uh, herself a great admirer of Morris and Ruskin, both of whom she met and enjoyed debating with, and whose theories can be found in the backbone of much of her work. Now, Morris's biographer, Fiona McCarthy, questions whether Jekyll, as we know her, would even exist without Morris, but I think this is undervaluing her unique contributions, but there's no doubt in the lasting influence of Morris on this great tastemaker. Um, and there's an underlying presence of Morris in the gardens and the influences of Ducal. So it's time we got to know Cam Scott a little better, so I'll take us on a, a little virtual tour. So if we navigate ourselves first by looking at the bird's eye view, this is uh, E.H. News drawing, and you can see the, how the garden's separated into rooms. I'll do a quick scan. So it starts in the front garden, goes round to the kitchen, and then we'll work our way back to the orchard to the mulberry at the back. Um, so we'll begin here in the front garden, which is uh, iconic and depicted in an illustration on the frontispiece of News From Nowhere. This is arguably Cal Scott's most familiar image, and it's loosely representative of the garden, as it was, as you can see here in a <coughs> period photograph. And the division between this area and the next section of the garden is formed by a yew hedge, which was topped with a topiary dragon in the shape of Fafnir, uh, the dragon which was from William's beloved Norse mythology. It's reported that Morris would shape Fafnir himself once a year in what became a ceremonial party. And next is the kitchen garden. And this was, in Morris's day, as his name suggests, the produce garden and was made of uh, beds of flowers and vegetables. And um, in a state that we can happily describe as abundant, including the presence of two fig trees in the northeast corner, the consumption of which is described in a memorial to May Morris after her death. And at the north door, there's a yew hedge which wrapped itself around the entrance. So you can imagine it would have cast quite a lot of shade over the hall, um, but possibly also provided some shelter at the north side of the house. It may have protected that end of the house from cold winds. Um, and next comes the orchard, which is quite self-explanatory. And this photograph that we found is really valuable when it stood next to the um, a drawing by Amar Valance because it, it shows us that we can have some reliability from some of the depictions in uh, how close to the layout of the garden actually was. And then we go to what's known as the Mulberry Garden due to the large mulberry tree at its centre. And the view from the green room window, um, which was one of May Morris's favourites, and it's easily the most documented area of the garden featuring in more photographs than, uh, than any other area, and also being the subject of many paintings, including those by the pre-Raphaelite artist Maria Svartali Stillman. Um, it's another area which lends itself to the promise of superabundance, as can be seen from the pictures, the tall flowers and many frames made up of sticks. It's been believed that the, the mulberry tree in the centre was present during Morris's time, and it's even described in Derek Baker's book as being the 400-year-old mulberry tree. But unfortunately, sometimes archival research does not reveal what you want or expect, and we found a picture of the garden without a key element. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, the, the misunderstanding is quite understandable to a point because mulberries have a, a really gnarly look about them, and they tend to look old before their time. So, uh, and the most frustrating thing is that the photograph collection doesn't have any dates on it, so it's hard for us to know 
when this was taken, but the presence of the tree here in an image from 1905 suggests that the mulberry may have been planted before Morris's death or shortly afterwards. <clears throat> so beyond the garden lies the meadow, described evocatively by the residents of Camps, but William May, Janey, and Rosetti, they all make mention of the meadow in their writings and letters. And they all take pleasure from it and describe the flowers it contained and the meanings it represented for them. Morris even persuaded the Thames Conservancy Board not to cut back the wild flowers on the riverbank. And there was a row of elms bordering the edge of the meadow which were lost as the same fate as most elms in the country, unfortunately. And this image here from the Avarisk Archive, the figure on the right is Mary Love, who was May Morris's companion in later years at Thames College, a very interesting character. Uh, there were many things we noted and grown in the gardens. The wild tulip, Tulipa sylvestris, uh, naturalised there and fritil areas uh, were abundant. And many native varieties of plants, which is something else that was adopted by Jekyll. And also we can assume a lack of double flowers, uh, as Morris had a disapproval of plant breeding and sound observations of double flowers are less valuable to insects. So I think one of the reasons that Morris's significance to gardens is not fully recognised due to his falling out of favour in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, there was less appetite for Morris in this period and his gardens fell into disrepair, as did the properties themselves to a lesser extent. And given the revival and appreciation for his work now, it's hard to imagine that the Red House was almost lost uh, due to its lack of perceived value. And Camscott didn't fare much better, as we'll, we'll come to see shortly. When William died, his body was laid to rest in the churchyard at Camp Scott, just down the road from the gardens, uh, under a stone designed by Philip Webb. And after his death, it was William's daughter, May Morris, who became most associated with the manor and its gardens, continuing to live there for a further 24 years after her mother died, with her companion Mary Lodge, that we saw in the previous picture. May continued to enjoy the gardens and maintain many of the philosophies of her father, she became an accomplished designer and needle crafter in her own right and became closely engaged with the Calmscott community. Her father's legacy was important to her and she intended for Calmscott to become a place where his values were upheld. And upon her death, she bequeathed Calmscott Manor to Oxford University, wishing for it to be maintained as it was in the time of her father, uh, with the intention that it should serve as a place of rest for artists and men of letters and scholars. Now, this period under the guardianship of Oxford University was not successful. The timing was unfortunate with the outbreak of war and the isolation of Camp Scott made it very unappealing and the journey to reach it was difficult and so it was very hard to maintain. John Betjeman was one of the few people to stay during this period but it appears out of a sense of duty more than uh, anything else. And the house suffered serious decay, however not quite to the extent of the gardens and uh, a very quick solution was needed sadly. <coughs> Uh, at some point during this period, Oxford University took the decision to turf over the gardens entirely. And by this time, the gardens must have been overgrown. However, the act of removal of all the plant materials from the plot was denying a future understanding of these very significant gardens. So it could be argued that it was understandable under the circumstances, if somewhat regrettable. So, <coughs> excuse me. In 1962, Camscott passed into the hands of its current guardians, the Society of Antiquaries. And over the following period, it was both tenanted and open to the public. Um, though with Morris out of favour, visitor numbers were quite few, and this only began to grow to much more significant figures like 15,000 in 2010. And the next significant date for the gardens is 1993, when the Society of Antiquaries undertook a restoration, commissioning the local firm of Colvin and Margaret to undertake the work. Now, in 1993, the significance of the gardens of Camp Scott were not fully understood, and garden conservation was a young discipline. And in fact, I would still argue that there's no clear understanding of how we approach um, plant-based historic gardens now, but that's the subject of my PhD. So at this time, the purpose of the gardens was seen in two ways. One, that it could reflect the plants and flowers that Morris used in his patterns, and secondly, that it extended visitor experience, offering extra space to manage visitor flow and crowding in the house. So using the gardens to show how Morris took his inspiration from the natural world is, is valuable, and there are examples of the gardens acting as inspiration for his designs. 
For example, Mae Morris describes how her father watched through the windows as blackbirds stole strawberries from strawberry plants, leading to one of his most popular mm -hmm. iconic designs, the strawberry field. And William never allowed the birds to be driven off, and May comments that there were always more birds than strawberries in the garden. <laughs> So, while he was evidently inspired by the natural world around him, the source of his unique pattern combinations and the layering of botanical images and designs are often considered to come from another source. He used um, old herbals for his plant drawings, including uh, this one's Gerard's Herbal. This is from Halmogridge's copy. And old copies of which show from the previous page, visible through to the next page because the page is so thin, you can see there's sort of uh, two different, you've got the Arbutus and Nido on this side and then another the plant on the other. And this is how we believe he made his layering of, of patterns uh, which made his design so unique and interesting. So, but this is his populist legacy and it's a really valid part of, of expression in the, in the gardens. So Colvin and Mogridge's plan for the garden began by reinstating the layout of subdivisions uh, using both ordnance survey maps and the EH News 1890 drawing, uh, reintroducing the garden rooms that we've just seen when we went round. Um, here's an overhead image, which what I think stands out from here is uh, the amount of lawn that there is now in the garden is quite uh, significant. So the front garden in the restoration follows the frontispiece from News of Nowhere and as the most famous image of the garden, its reinstatement was essential to the expectations of the visitor and their relationship with the garden. And Fafnir too was reinstated with much agonising over its design. There's a very long paper trail of debate over its final shape, quite fascinating debate, and they had experts from the National Trust that came in and I've heard lots of descriptions about what, what we ended up with, I, some people say it's a slug with a notebook, I'll leave it from you to, you to decide exactly what to do. So, and at this time the garden, uh, the kitchen garden now magically becomes the lawn garden and this change represents the most significant departure from Morris's garden and is a good example of the compromises that exist in heritage gardens. Converting the kitchen garden to a lawn creates space for visitors, uh, which was the requirement of the restoration. And secondly, the cost of maintenance of what was the kitchen garden could be prohibitive uh, to the sustainability of the property. And the orchard, uh, which was more easily reinstated, then without any knowledge of the original varieties, there is some conjecture about heritage varieties that predate the Morrises were chosen for this. And finally, we move on to the mulberry garden, which while it maintains uh, the ornamental value of the original, there isn't an attempt to capture the space as it was instead opting for polite borders which are attractive to guests, but if we're looking for the presence of Morris, then we're lacking that key introductory phrase of superabundance. The large displays of tulip bulbs that are here are popular with guests, but are perhaps uh, what Morris would describe as, as the colour in the garden, flowers on mass are mighty strong colour, and if not used with great caution, are very destructive to pleasure in gardening. On the whole, I think the best and safest plan is to mix up your flowers and rather eschew great masses of colour. In combination, I mean, I love statements like this because I think they, they show us with just what a keen eye he, he views the garden. It's an artist's uh, perspective of colour and texture and shape, and uh, it shows how he brings his sensibilities as an artist and a pattern designer to the garden. And the meadow is not reinstated, and uh, the loss of the elms is really significant to the spaces he means. So, where does this leave us now? The, the gardens of William Morris are definitely underrepresented and hopefully are presented why they might be considered uh, important, not only from the point of view of his contribution to garden style and design, which through his advocates, as distinguished as William Robinson and Gertrude Jekyll, were exported around the world, but also how his gardens can show us something of how he lived and how his ideals, uh, how he proposed we might live. And for how there is laboratory and the inspiration behind his thinking, not only artistically, as we've seen in his art and pattern design, but also his philosophical thinking through News from Nowhere and his lectures. And the growing significance of the gardens are hopefully becoming clearer, as also we're coming more to understand, as highlighted in a recent paper by Caroline Lucas MP, that Morris is one of the forefathers of the environmental movement. Now, the great thing for Morris is that the the guardianship of the Society of Antiquaries provides a safe confidence in the garden's future protection and interpretation. And also Red House is now managed by the National Trust and the garden is likely to have some form of rest, uh, restoration in the future, albeit with the visitor-led caveats that come with the National Trust garden. 
I'll uh, I'm leave you with this image of William in repose in the meadow, which is my favourite image from the archives. Thank you.